All right. Hey, everyone. Hope, uh, hope you're doing well. We're back with another little uh, programming live stream here. And uh, yeah, let's make sure we don't have any feedback loops. All right, cool. Yeah, so today we're going to be working on the BYOD plugin, and we're going to be working on adding a new effect, which is going to be based on the Univibe pedal. Um, Univibe is kind of a well-known famous-ish pedal, so we'll have a lot to dig into, but yeah, I'll uh, just get started by uh, trying to set up some uh, basic code templates for it, and then we can dig into DSP a little bit more and, and talk a little bit more about how I'm going to approach the, uh, the, the circuit modeling and so on. So yeah, should be a good time. Um, all right, so let's just go ahead and start with a new Hmm, should I put this in a folder? I'm going to go ahead and make a folder. Um, you vibe, um, you vibe. So you vibe. New vibe. Um, and let's go ahead and update our CMake configuration to include uh, the new stuff here. So let's see. New vibe. New vibe .cpp. Um, and yeah, let's uh, get it going here. So um, we'll make this a base processor. And I'll uh, I'll just copy over most of the stuff from the tremolo because a lot of these. We're going to need a lot of the same functions here, so that's a decent starting point. Um, so, yeah, now just a bit more. Uh, a bit more template code, and then we should be able to actually see something in the. Uh, we should be able to actually see something in the UI, which is always exciting. Um, all right, CPP. So, actually, let's copy over one more thing, which is going to be the port configs. So, this is going to be a module that supports modulation. So we're going to have to think about that as we develop it. And there's a few spots in particular where that's going to be important. So let's just do a big copy paste for now. And then we can delete all the stuff we don't want, which, if we're being honest, is probably going to be most of it. Um, actually, I guess we'll also need some audio buffers for the audio and modulation output. So let's copy those as well. Um, all right. Um, we'll have to come up with a name that isn't tremolo, or sorry, that isn't tremolo and isn't univibe. Uh, but I'll get that in a minute. So for right now, let's just get rid of everything that we don't want, um, which right now is going to be most things. We're also going to want to include our parameter helpers. Got to have that. Um, we're going to need to create a parameter layout. Going to come back to that one. Um, we're going to need to prepare the processor. Again, going to come back to this one for the most part. Um, the audio buffer stuff, I guess I can leave for now. And I'll probably need that spec object, so I'll just leave that for now. Uh, oh, these are helper functions from the tremolo, so we don't need those. 
process audio we are going to need. And then most of this stuff we can probably get rid of. Um, Not uh, what I intended to do. There we go. All right. Um, cool. So we've got our modulation connections. Now we've got our audio connections. I'm just going to delete everything in here. Um, and then we've got our bypass state, which I can probably leave the same as the tremolo, I would guess. Maybe I'll bring back this. Uh, processors for helpers uh, business and that way we can have access to this method and then finally I'm gonna need uh, some colors so the original univibe uh, it was like black and white if I remember right it was like black and gray yeah not a lot of color going on in there Huh. Yeah, black and white. I don't. I don't really love in uh, like uh, on a screen. Kind of how how it would look on a screen. So maybe not that. I don't know. Maybe like a dark gray and a white would work okay. Let's try that. Um, dark gray and a little darker, and then we'll do actually. Let's do light gray and then a good bit brighter. And I don't want to call it Univibe because that's probably like trademarked or something. So what if we call it Solo Vibe instead? Uh, uh, and let's see, it was like Vibrato Chorus. So I'll just say that a Vibrato Chorus effect uh, based on the Univide pedal. Yeah, I don't want to say modeled after because I had some ideas for things that I might do, which would deviate a little bit from the original circuit. So I don't want to pretend like this is a exact uh, model, but it is going to be based on the original the original effect. So yeah, we should have some uh, some interesting things we can do with it. Um, cool. So if I build this and load it into my DAW, this processor should appear after I add it to the processor store, which is not like a store where you spend money. It's just a store in that it, it really storage might be better. It stores all of the processors. Uh, yeah, maybe I should have called it solo vibe instead of Univibe for the, the class and the file name as well. But probably fine. Um, and then I think this is alphabetical, but it should still work. Oh, no, it doesn't because S O. Yeah, that goes there. All right. So now if I build it, we should be able to get the, uh, the processor to show up in BYOD when we load it into the DAW. And actually, that might be fun because then I can also talk through a few of the other changes that I've made recently, which uh, some of them are pretty fun. So I'm excited to show them off a little bit. Um, let's also get the DAW ready here. So we've got Bitwig, we've got our limiter just in case. I'm going to keep things muted for now anyway, since I don't really have any audio that I want to play through it at the moment. Um, while that's building, let's look at this research paper, which is what I'm going to be basing my model off of. I don't know that I'm going to do everything exactly the way that it's done in the in the paper, but uh, yeah, I've got a lot of uh, ideas that are all kind of based on what they're doing here. So um, yeah, so first, uh, this paper was actually written by Champ uh, Champ Darbundit, who uh, Oh, I didn't mean to click on that. Um, he was at USC at the time and then went on to study at Karma. And now I believe he's at McGill University in uh, 
uh, Montreal. And yeah, this was a paper that he wrote back in 2018, 2019. Yeah, at, at DAFX in 2019, which is also uh, the first year that I went to DAFX. So that was a lot of fun. I got to meet Champ there. Super nice guy. Um, and yeah, so the idea with the model presented here is that they kind of fit, uh, they basically come up with a, a model that is sort of a loose physical model, and then they kind of fit some parameters to things that they measured in the device itself. Um, so this is the circuit, uh, the overall circuit. And similar to some other vibrato, phaser, chorus effects, other, other effects of this era that use modulation, the way that it works is that you've got this LFO that's connected to a light, uh, and then the light is placed near these light-dependent resistors. And so as the light level fluctuates, the uh, light-dependent resistors will have a different resistance value, and that's what creates your modulation. Um, we've also got this preamp and output buffer. Those are obviously, those obviously matter, but I'm not sure I'm going to model them just because kind of the idea in BYOD is that you're just getting one part of your pedal. And then if you want, uh, you know, some distortion or some, some other thing going on, uh, you can do that a different way. So yeah, I'm not totally sure I'm going to do those parts of the circuit. Um, modeling the LFO, or at least the LFO in the way that it affects the, the light-dependent resistors is going to be interesting, so I'm excited to see how that plays out. Um, for the vibrato chorus switch, the idea here is that uh, basically with vibrato, you're just getting the output of stage four, well, the output of stage four and the output buffer, and that's the output of the pedal. Um, with chorus, you're getting a mix of that signal with, uh, it's a little bit hard to see, but if you, if you trace this back, it basically connects back to stage one here. So it's kind of a weird, uh, sort of mix option where with vibrato, you're getting the full output, uh, sort of, the, sort of the full wet output. And with chorus, you're getting the wet output mixed with this signal. It's not quite the dry signal. It's like a little bit processed. Uh, so at the very least, I want that to be more of a continuous control so you can sort of fade between uh, the full wet and the full dry signal. And then for the dry signal, I'm not sure if I want to do it the way they do it here. Um, my feeling is that I'm going to want to do it as just like a standard uh, mix control. So you're mixing between a completely dry signal and a completely wet signal, rather than this kind of like fake dry signal that they're using for the chorus here. Um, so that's that's my feeling. Um, but yeah, of course, we can always change that later, depending on what we want to do. Um, and yeah, this is the this is a picture of the actual device, which is uh, kind of old school, as you know. This was before kind of the small pedals that we're used to today were, were a big thing. So that's kind of where the, the look and the shape comes from. Uh, and they've actually got some pictures in the paper too, which are kind of neat. So uh, yeah, over here, they've got these pictures that you can see here. Um, so you can actually see, typically it's covered, but if you remove the cover, you can actually see the light dependent resistors and the lamp that's placed. It's meant to be an equal distance from each of them, which is kind of neat. Um, and, and it makes sense because they're trying to make it so that each of the light dependent resistors is uh, has the same resistance at a given point in time. Um, whether or not that works out perfectly, it, it usually doesn't work out perfectly, but you know that's where some of the interesting, interesting things come from. Um, oh, hey, George is here. Welcome, George. Um, yeah, this will be a fun one. So let's see if our build is finished. Build is finished. Just a few unused variables, which makes sense. Let's see, debug build.
Oh, hey, Bo is here. Cool. Uh, Bo is here too. That's cool. Yeah. Sorry, it's so late. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm on I'm on West Coast time, so maybe I should try to do these earlier in the day, so it's easier for people to tune in uh, if they're in Europe or wherever. Uh, and it's I don't know. It's probably too early for people like in China or something too. So I don't know if I'm I don't know if I'm doing this at a good time for anyone outside the U.S., which is too bad, but eh, we'll figure it out. Um, so that's the that's the look that we've got currently. That's not horrible. I don't know. It's not my favorite, but maybe we'll maybe we'll fiddle with that more later. I don't really feel like dealing with the UI side of things now. Um, so yeah, we'll we'll work that out uh, as far as what we want it to look like. Um, but more importantly, let's figure out what parameters we want. So. Um, let's see, this is going to be a const string for each parameter. So in the original pedal, all they had was volume, intensity, and then this chorus vibrato switch. Um, instead of chorus vibrato, we'll call that mix. So let's do that. Um, I don't know that we need a volume control. I'll leave that out for now. Um, yeah, a lot of things in BYOD don't really have a volume control. Uh, I guess it could be useful for gain staging, but I don't know. I'll, I'll leave that out for now, and then we can add it in later if we want. It's an easy thing to add. Um, intensity. So intensity is kind of interesting because that's meant to control how much that's meant to control the intensity of the signal driving the lamp, right? Um, in our case, I don't know. Well, this is kind of interesting. I don't know exactly which version of the pedal they were modeling, because they've got a speed control too, not just an intensity control. Is that... Uh, hmm. Yeah, I guess the original didn't have a speed control, but some other uh, version of it did, maybe. Or maybe this was just like an internal. Uh, maybe this is just like an internal thing that that would be uh, set at the factory. I don't know. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. Anyway, so I'm thinking we'll have a speed and intensity control. Um, Speed and intensity. Intensity. So that's kind of where I'm starting. One thing that I've done in other parts of BYOD, which is kind of cool, is basically having some control over how many stages. Uh, if, if you have like a multi stage circuit like this, you can have some control over how many stages are in the model. And that could be fun. I'm kind of, I'm kind of feeling like that would be a good thing to do with this one. Um, yeah, and that, that's something that I, I really enjoy about working on BYOD is that we can do things like that, which you couldn't really do, or it, they're they're much more difficult to do in the physical world. Um, but in the in the digital world, you can do them fairly easily. You just copy things and, and go from there. Um, but yeah, so let's let's make one stage first, and then we'll figure out uh, then we'll figure out what we want to do from there. I guess we'll also need to set up our LFO, which shouldn't be too hard. Let's remind ourselves how we did it previously. So tremolo. Well, I don't know that tremolo is the easiest. Uh, I don't know that tremolo is the easiest one to pull from. Um, Hmm. Actually, huh. maybe it's a good time to talk about this first before we get too deep into the implementation. So this is some circuit analysis for the phasing circuits. Uh, we'll definitely get back to that in a minute. Um, but something that's really interesting. So they do these measurements of the light-dependent resistors in the uh, 
in the petal. Um, and kind of the idea here with the gray box model is that rather than trying to figure out all the physics of how the light impacts the light dependent resistor, as they do kind of this gray box thing where they measure at different levels of intensity, basically they, they call it like forming a wave table of uh, essentially as the intensity goes from zero to 10, what happens to the LFO in terms of how it affects the light dependent resistor. So this is essentially one cycle of the resistance measured from the light dependent resistor, which is kind of neat. Um, let's see, so they do this RLDR, which is uh, going too fast here, sorry, okay. R6 VLDR, interesting. So how do they do this exactly? Um, what are they measuring? Oh, okay, I see. So this is RLDR and then R6 is a separate resistor, uh, but they're in series with each other. So what are they actually measuring? Voltage measurements were taken across the LDR and R6 and across R6 alone, allowing us to derive the transient resistance of the LDR as a part of the voltage divider. Oh, I see, okay. So they have the voltage across the light dependent resistor and the voltage across R6. They know the resistance of R6 from some pre previous measurements. They can use that to compute the resistance of the light dependent resistor. That's pretty neat. Um, all right. So they've got kind of this interesting shape here, uh, which I kind of wish they showed just one cycle as well as the full wave table. I think that would be interesting to look at. Um, so basically, something that we're going to have to think about with BYOD is that the way that modulation works in BYOD is that you've got this modulation input and output. And uh, sort of the rule for modulation signals is in BYOD is that they're designed to be in between negative 1 and 1. Um, so what we're going to have to work out is some mapping between the negative one to one LFO signal and, or sorry, the negative one to one modulation signal and the, well, I don't know, what's that like 0.2 mega ohms? Uh, I don't know how, how low you want to go there, but like some small resistance to like one, one or 1 1.2 mega ohms. Um, so we're going to need to figure out some kind of mapping for that. Um, yeah, interesting. Okay, so they don't tell you exactly. Uh, they don't tell you exactly what the wavetables are, which I guess makes sense. They're keeping some secrets for themselves. Um, but we can figure out our own wavetables that are interesting and provide some interesting modulation uh, characteristics, even if they're not exactly uh, exactly the same as what they measured from their specific pedal. Um, they also uh, have this interesting table here, which shows uh, a couple of different uh, constants that they measure from the different stages of the pedal. So you can see here that the LFOs in, in how they affect the uh, in how they affect the light dependent resistor are not exactly identical. Um, okay, George is asking, are the stages modeled independently? Uh, you could say yes or no, I guess. So at least the way that I interpret it, they use the same model for all of the stages. I found that a little bit odd. I, I thought that uh, stage one might need a slightly different treatment just because of the way that it's constructed. It looks, at least it looks a little bit different. I haven't gone through all of the uh, an analysis myself, but it looks a little different. But at least from my sort of brief reading a couple of days ago, it seemed like they're using the same model architecture basically for each stage. Uh, but the actual component values and things that they're using uh, from there are not the same. So, so we have uh, different constants basically for each stage. 
which I think will be, I think that'll be interesting. I think that'll give us some neat uh, variation. Um, one thing where that could get a little funky is if we decide that maybe we want to have more than four stages. Um, yeah, that would be kind of kind of interesting. Um, yeah, if we want to have more than four stages, then maybe we need to generate our own constants that are somewhere in the range uh, of these other ones here. I don't know what that would look like exactly, but it could be interesting. Um, yeah, so basically we've got we've got these uh, we've got these values here that take us from the minimum LDR value to the maximum LDR value, and then we have some average. They don't exactly explain the average, at least as far as I can tell. Um, but I was thinking the average should be like the sort of the nominal case. So for mapping, if we're trying to map from negative one to one to the range of this resistor value, then it would make sense to me that the average value, like the, the zero value in the negative one to one range would map to the average resistance value here. I don't know that that works out exactly. I feel like it probably doesn't, but maybe for our purposes, that's okay. Um, but yeah, so let's uh, let's put together a little um, yeah, they don't, they don't share the wavetables. Uh, there, there's another thing that they don't share either, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, but yeah, so let's put together a little script here so that we can look at uh, we can look at some different LFOs and just get a sense of what we want to do here. So, I'll put a, a new folder here, Univibe, uh, and we'll make a Python script. So this will be uh, Univibe LFO. Probably didn't spell that right, did I? Univibe LFO.py. And let's see. So import, uh, actually, I don't really like doing Python stuff in C-Lion. Let's do that somewhere else. Um, so that in VS Code, that'll be better. Hopefully, I've been having trouble with VS Code lately, but I think it'll be all right. Um, so, import NumPy. Uh, and import so um, let's see here. We're going to have our basic LFO signal. Uh, actually, first, let's set our sample rate. Let's set our LFO rate. Um, so our LFO rate is going to be, um, let's make it 10 hertz. I don't know. And so our LFO signal is going to be np dot sine two times np dot pi uh, times. Okay, I need an n also. Uh, let's do a thousand, I guess. So np a range n, and this will be times LFO rate over fs, and this should give us our LFO signal. Let's see if it does. Yeah, George is saying that's a Darlington pair in stages two, three, and four. Yeah, so we're we're actually going to do something a little different with the transistors. Uh, that again, it's just based on what they're doing in the paper here. Um, but yeah, getting back to that schematic, so that we've got Darlington pairs here, but just a single transistor there. That's not the only difference. We've also got this uh, extra output sort of in stage one. Yeah, there's like a few other things that are funky about stage one as well. And I thought there might have been something different about stage four, too. And I'm not remembering it at the moment, but yeah, we can come back to that later. Um, OK, so we need more samples if we want to see the full LFO signal. There we go. Um, actually, let's just do 4,800 samples. So we're looking at one cycle exactly. 
So now let's see if we can make an LFO mapping, right? And we want to have our LFO signal. We want to have our uh, minimum value, our max value, and our average value. And let's see if we can map between those. So uh, we'll say mapped LFO equals numpy copy, eh, numpy copy LFO. Um, and for now, we'll just return the mapped LFO. And let's see, I'll just make this called MLFO equals LFO map, and we'll do LFO and find our find our values here. Where is that table? There we go. So we'll do, I don't know, 300k something. So 300k is like 300 e3. Max is like what three meg, I guess. So uh, three e6, and then our average is well, like seven, six or seven uh, k, six or seven hundred k. Yeah, let's do seven hundred k. And then we'll just do another plot. So. Um, Let's see, so we'll plot the LFO and then we'll plot the mapped LFO. And right now they'll be the same. <laughs> Danny wants us to start at the beginning. Um, yeah, I guess just a quick refresher. Basically, we're going to be working on a model of the Univibe guitar pedal using this paper. Um, oh, I should have put the paper in the video description. I wonder if I can still do that. Uh, can I do that? Yeah, there we go. Reference paper. Cool. Yeah, so if you want to look at the paper, I guess you'll have to like refresh or something, but uh, you can follow along from there. But yeah, so we're going to be working from this paper and essentially implementing an emulation of the Univibe in BYOD. Um, and so right now I'm just working on getting the LFO mapping set up. And we can see what that'll do inside the effect in a few minutes. Um, so basically what I want to have happen is I want negative one to be mapped to the minimum value. I want positive one to be mapped to the maximum value and zero to be mapped to the average value. So what does that actually look like? I think the average was 7K, but you have 700K. Um, oh, oh, good call. I flipped these actually. The minimum is 7K. The average is 300K. Thanks for catching me on that. Uh, so the minimum is 7K. The average is 300K. <laughs> yeah, no worries. We both, we both read that wrong. <laughs> But we read it wrong in different ways, and so we were able to catch it. That's good. Um, all right, so we've got, yeah, we've got those three. Awesome. Cool. So how do we do a three-point mapping? So if we had two points, we could just do basically a linear mapping. I guess maybe we need a quadratic mapping. Is that the, is that the trick here? Probably, right? Or maybe like something like an exponential mapping would make more sense, you know? Yeah, let's try an exponential mapping. So actually, let's just go to Desmos for a minute just to have some more pretty pictures to look at. So basically, we care about the range between minus one and one, right? And we want to map from, well, let's just say, let's just say seven to 300, sorry, seven to uh, 3000. We'll ignore the, uh, we'll, we'll ignore the uh, times 10 to the third thing for now. 
just so we can have things that are meaningful to look at. So uh, we'll go from seven to 3,000. That'll be, I don't know if there's a way to do a logarithmic y-axis, is there? Hey, there is. That's super cool. Awesome. Hey, Ethan. All right, we got a party here today. This is fun. All right, so basically, we want to have y equals, uh, we'll say, b times the exponent of cx plus a, right? And we'll make sliders for all of these. So let's see. I feel like this just has to be 7. Uh, well, not quite. So basically, we want Is there a way to just fit this with Wolfram Alpha? Wolfram Alpha exponential regression, maybe? Exponential regression. OK. Uh, <laughs> let's see. So we want negative 1 to go to 7. We want 0 to go to. 300 and then 3000, right? Yeah, 300. And then we want positive one to go to 3000. And that's it. We don't want any more. All right. See what happens. Maybe Wolfram Alpha will just solve it for us, right? Um, okay. That seems reasonable. Um, you know what else we can do is uh, we can actually just plot the points here, right? So we can plot minus one comma seven, right? And it should give us that, uh, right? Um, this most... Plotting points. Oh, you do parentheses. That's it. All right. Cool. So we've got our little thing down there. You can see. Uh, yeah, I guess I needed to leave a little more room. All right. And that should help. Maybe a little more up there even. Uh, OK, so we've got that. Can I just add more points here? That'd be great. Uh, zero, 300, and one, 3,000. Cool. Yeah, so now we've got these three points there, there, and there. Oh, maybe we could just do a linear mapping. Maybe it's not all that complicated. But let's, let's see what Wolfram gave us and maybe just use that. So we've got A equals zero. There's no, no offset, basically. Uh, we've got the exponent equals 2.3173. Right, and then B equals 295.638. Right. So that's clearly not right because we're missing this bottom point here, right? Um, negative one goes to seven. Yeah, that that's missing. We're missing that point. Um, which leads me to believe that we actually do need um, we actually do need the offset here. Um, Yeah, see, we've got a big, we've got a big miss on that one. I feel like we should be able to get this. Oh, I guess the reason it looks linear, duh, is because uh, it's because we've got an exponential y or a logarithmic y-axis. Of course, it looks linear. Um, all right, so 
let's see if we can just work this out ourselves. I think that'll be more useful than uh, just giving it to Wolfram Alpha. Um, because I, I don't think it, it, it's super nice to just be using these fixed constants for everything. It would be nice if we could kind of generate them ourselves, right? So um, let's see, when C, or sorry, when X equals zero, then we've just got B plus A, right? So we've got kind of a, a more, uh, we've got kind of a more, uh, I don't know what you would call it, um, a simpler case there, right? So we can say we've got Y average equals 300. We've got, uh, and I can just pl plug this in here too. Y average, I can say we've got Y min equals seven. Uh, plug that in there. And Y max equals 3000. And so, let me get my uh, pen and paper here. Sorry, I just want to look great on the stream because uh, I can't really see what I'm what I'm doing here. I'll see if I can figure out a way to figure out a way to make it uh, visible. I should get one of those little scanner things like the my teachers used to use in high school. Um, all right, so when X is zero, we've got Y equals B plus A, which equals Y average, right? So we have some, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, uh, relationship between A and B and Y average. So we, we can kind of express those in terms of each other, right? Um, when x is one, right, we get y max equals b times e to the c plus a, right? And when we have uh, y min, right, that's kind of the opposite. We got b e to the minus c plus a. Oh yeah, yeah. So for Ethan and anyone else who, who just got here, basically we're looking at how the LFO uh, is kind of represents itself in the value of the light dependent resistor in the circuit and how that changes over time. Um, in BYOD, modulation signals are represented as a signal from minus one to one. And so we want to basically have a way to map from the uh, minus one to one range up to uh, whatever's uh, the value of the light dependent resistor that matches at that point in time. Um, so let's see here. I guess the other thing we could do is just have some skew that happens in the minus one to one region and then you know uh propagate that through no i don't, I don't want to do that sorry that was a bad idea <laughs> um all right so let's see here i can kind of do a little bit of arithmetic to rearrange things and i'll, I'll try to get this on the screen in a minute here sorry about that uh, so y max minus a over b equals e to the c. So log of y max minus a over b equals c. Right. And so then we've got these like two corollaries that uh, we've got these two negatives. Actually, you know what? Screw it. <laughs> We're gonna do it here. Um, let's see, can I do a new file? So this will be here. This will be LFO math. And this will be a markdown file, right? So basically what we're talking about here is, uh, Let 
we've got kind of these three equations, right? So we've got, well, actually, I guess we've got our basic equation first, which is a y equals a times e uh, exponent e to the c x. Oh, I need to do the brackets, right? E to the c x. Oh, whoops, I put my names here. All right. This is our basic equation, right? And we have three data points, right? So we've got y average. Uh, man, sometimes I'm not a big fan of LaTeX with all the brackets. Anyway, so y average equals b times e to the 0 plus a, right? And e to the 0 is 1, so that's just b plus a. Then I'm going to do multi line here. Y min, and I'll start with y max equals b times e to the c, because x is just one plus a. And then one more line. We've got y min, and this is minus c, because x is minus one. So now we've got these three, basically these three points. Um, and so we can start trying to simplify things. So the first thing I'm thinking is just setting it up so that we can get C isolated because C is kind of the trickiest one to find, I think. So if we rearrange this equation, we get Y max minus A, and then we're gonna have to make this a fraction. Uh, frac over b equals e to the c, right? And so then we can do a natural log. So uh, I think we can just do it like this, right? Yeah. Uh, let's see, we've got our parentheses. Cool. And we can you know, copy this expression. So we've got our natural log of that equals c, right? But we also know that if we do the same math with this third equation, then we get the same thing with y min and negative c, right? Yeah, that makes sense. Oh, I didn't do the line break there. All right. So now if we basically just recognize that these are both equal to C, we can kind of uh, work backwards from there. And so we end up with uh, these two things being equal to the negative of each other. So I can just do equals negative and I put a log of that. Yeah. And so let's see. What happens to the negative of a logarithm? I always forget my logarithm rules. Logarithm rules. Uh, uh, okay, log of power. So in this case, y is just negative one, right? This is the same thing as just saying the stuff inside is to the power negative one, right? Which basically is inverting it. So we can basically say that's the same thing. Here, I'll put it on a new line so that we don't confuse ourselves later. Uh, that's the same thing as saying we invert this fraction and we get rid of the negative, right? So that's basically what we're doing. And then we can natural or we, we can take the exponent of both sides, which makes the natural log go away. And now we've got this. Yeah, so now we've got that uh, equation there. Oh, that's not the prettiest. Uh, 
I feel like I'm gonna have to cross multiply, but I don't particularly want to do that. Hmm. Well, let's just do it, see what happens. So on one side, we'll have b squared. On the other side, we'll have y max times y min. Then we'll have uh, plus a times y max plus y min, and then plus a squared, right? And then we know we have a relationship between A and B, so we could use that. Now we've got kind of a quadratic thing here, which I'm not loving, if I'm being honest. Um, maybe I'm making this more complicated than it needs to be. Maybe there's a simpler thing. Let's come back to that in a second. Uh, let's see. From alpha. Uh, bit curve. Let's see. See, I want to be able to put in like a custom equation and just have it fit fit that right. Um. Let's see. Let's do a uh, fit y equals b e to the cx plus a. And then I'll give it the data here. So we've got minus one, seven, uh, zero, 300, and uh, what was the last one we had? Uh, one thousand. See if it'll do it. My guess is that it won't, but yeah. All right. I group this stuff together. Yeah. Okay. Still not happy. That's fine. Um. Let's see if we can get this to work. So right now, that's somewhere around 20. So let's put in like minus 20 or something. Uh, I guess we probably need a little more even. Uh, you know, let's zoom out a touch. Um, all right, where are we at now? Like nine minus 22, I guess. Yeah, that puts us there. Um, all right, and then let's see, maybe just make this an even 300, I don't know, okay, I guess we need to go smaller, not bigger, 290, um, I guess the other thing is how much do we care about matching exactly what was in the paper? Um, since that was just kind of measured, right? So if we get something in the neighborhood that we can generate constants for on our own, then maybe we don't care so much about getting the exact thing. Um, and we could just say, hey, it's like, you know, that was the LDR that they measured. Our LDR is a little different, has a similar kind of, similar kind of shape, but, you know, it's not exactly the same. Um, I kind of like that idea. Yeah, so now we've got, you know, a ballpark for where our, our things should be, right? So we could go maybe minus 30 to minus 20. We could go maybe, uh, I don't know, the exponent one is probably a little bit more. We probably need to constrain this one a little more tightly. And then maybe this one, I don't know, 
maybe this would even kind of go nuts with it and give it a much bigger range. I don't know. So the main thing we need to be careful about is that we need to make sure that this never goes below zero. Honestly, we should probably make sure it never goes below one. Ah, okay. Yeah. So that's maybe that's a little bit. Okay. Yeah. We're definitely getting into some difficult territory down there. Um, so maybe we cap this at minus 25. Um, and then maybe we cap this at 275. Well, that's still not ideal, um, especially if we go to high exponents. So if we go to a high exponent like that, uh, maybe let's cap this even at like 300, right? And then maybe we cap this at like minus, uh, oh, I don't know, minus 22. Oops. Uh, minus 22 up to minus 18. I don't know. Okay. Oh, wait. I totally messed up that range. Uh, 300 is what I wanted for the, the bottom end of that range. Okay. So that's like the lowest uh, we're going to get, which is like an ohm. That's, a, well, we're going to multiply this by a thousand anyway. So it's fine. Yeah. 1K is totally fine. Um, yeah, we can, we can make that work. So yeah, now we've got a nice little range of potential uh, LDR kind of LDR contours that we could get. So yeah, this will be neat. We can get a bunch of different uh, a bunch of different mappings, and we could use this for we can use this to get a different mapping for each stage of the uh, each stage of the uh, pedal. Or sorry, each stage of the circuit. So that'll be cool. All right. Yeah, this is good. This gives me a good idea of what I want to do uh, with the LDR. I guess we don't actually need this uh, folder with the simulation stuff. Probably doesn't matter too much. Um, but yeah, so let's go ahead and implement that. So first thing, we're going to need a sine wave. This is in case we need to generate our own modulation. So this is the base LFO. Um, and then, yeah, let's see. So with the LFO, we're going to want to prepare that with the mono spec here. So LFO prepare mono spec. And then when we actually go to process here, here we need to create our own modulation signal. So we're going to do that here. Um, this code I copied from elsewhere. We don't care about that. So we're going to do uh, LFO set frequency. Oh, you know what? I didn't do the parameters yet. I should have done that before I got started on all this weird DSP stuff. Uh, all right, so we've got our rate param. We've got our uh, what would we call it intensity param. We've got our mix parameter. Oh, these should be pointers. Um, but we're going to want some smoothing too. How much do we care about the rate smoothing? Yeah, we probably care about that, don't we? All right, let's, uh, let's change this to a smooth buffer value uh, float. And it should be multiplicative, I guess. Value smoothing types, multiplicative. So this is great for an smooth. And then we don't need that. Uh, and we'll decide for the other ones. We'll decide later if we want to have a smoother, how we want to how we want to handle smoothing for those parameters. Um, 
So now let's actually create the parameters. So we can actually reuse some of the parameters from the tremolo effect we were copying. So frequency parameter, that way we'll go one hertz up to 20 hertz, and maybe we'll have the default be like five or something. I don't know. I feel like this effect is going to sound good slow. So I want to be able to get down there. So we have our rate tag. Uh, this is going to be our intensity tag. Intensity. And then we're going to have our mix tag for mix. Um, oh, speed is what we called it. All right, that's fine. Speed tag, speed. And we'll change this to speed per hand. That's fine, just keeping the names consistent with the pedal. All right. Um, and so let's see. We want to disable the rate parameter, uh, rate tag. Oh, speed tag. Whoops. We want to disable that when we're using external modulation. So here we want speed param smooth. Uh, let's see, set parameter handle. And this should be, uh, let's see, get parameter pointer, I think it was. Get parameter pointer. Uh, VTS speed. So this basically just gets the parameter and loads it into our smoother. Let me make sure I got all the arguments for that right. VTS parameter ID. Cool, that'll work. Um, great. So now we need to prepare this speed param smooth. Uh, prepare sample rate samples per block. And we also need to set the ramp length. We'll do, I don't know, a few milliseconds, 10 milliseconds. Um, and then we'll also reset it. Well, no, it'll get reset automatically. No need to do that. Cool. So um, yeah, here we go. So we'll do speed param smooth dot process the number of samples in the buffer. Um, actually, we're going to want to do this regardless of what this if statement does. So let's put that up here. Then in here, we're going to want to say LFO uh, if LFO, whoops, well, sorry, if speed param smooth is smoothing, we're going to want to do one thing. And else we're going to want to just do LFO set frequency speed param smooth get current value and then LFO process mod buffer. There we go. That just generates the sine wave in the mod buffer. If our parameter is smoothing, then we need to be a little more careful. So we'll do uh, speed param smooth data equals speed param smooth uh, get smooth buffer. And now we'll do this. So we'll do um, for auto, I don't think I need to do auto and. Uh, so for auto and freak sample in, we'll zip the speed. Uh, that's getting too fancy. We don't need to do that. Um, for our end, well, let's do this. Uh, enumerate. Uh, we're going to enumerate over mod buffer out. Uh, How do I want to 
to do this. Sorry, I'm kind of spacing here. Um, <laughs> yeah, let's do this. So we'll do mod data equals mod buffer, mod out buffer, get right pointer zero. And then we'll do um, four i equals zero. Let's do n. I like n better today. N is less than num samples uh, plus plus n. And so then we can do basically the same thing we were doing here, just per sample. So we can update the frequency, uh, speed params, move data, set it in. And then we'll do mod data equals LFO dot process sample. There we go. Ah, sorry, that took me so long. Should be simple enough. All right. So now we've got our modulation signal in the range negative one to one, and that should work fine. So now we need to actually start implementing our modulation stages. So uh, let's see. Let's make a new class for this. So this will be uh, Univibe stage. Make this, let's make this a struct. Uh, I feel like we're going to want to, I feel like we're going to want to do more stuff with the internals of this. Um, So we're going to want to have some data in here. Uh, mod, oh, of course, float. Uh, this will be LDR LFO data. There we go. We're also going to want to prepare this, right? Uh, prepare double sample rate samples for the block. And I'll put that in the CPP file in a minute. Uh, George wants to know, uh, are we submitting to ADC? I don't know yet. So I talked with uh, Chris Clark, who I'd, I'd done some work with before, and we had some ideas for things we might want to do for ADC. Um, I know he's very busy at the moment working on his PhD dissertation, so uh, I haven't heard from him in a minute, which totally makes sense from everyone I've heard who's written a PhD dissertation and has talked about the process. Um, but yeah, so we had talked about maybe doing something. I'll just have to talk with him and see if that's something we want to do. Uh, I don't know. I've also, I haven't traveled to Europe since uh, last summer when I, I moved back to the U.S., uh, and I have kind of enjoyed staying in one in one continent for a while, uh, <laughs> but I don't know. It is a lot of fun, so maybe I'll maybe I'll maybe it's worth the trip for me. I, I haven't decided yet, but yeah, we'll see. Um, stage. There we go. All right, so we'll get that stuff going shortly. Um, and then we'll want to have some kind of process method. So process, uh, this will be float star, uh, data gradient, um, samples, and we'll make this no except because, um, all right. So these are like the basic things we want to do with our single stage. All right. Um, and so next, we're going to want to have some way of controlling, controlling the LDR warping. So this, we'll call this LDR. Well, LDR map, uh, yeah, we'll do this. And we'll just say we've got float A, B, 
and C, right? So that means I need to save this. That'll be our domain. And then have a link that I can uh, reference. Reference. So the idea here is that we want to map an LFO signal minus one to one to an LDR resistance value in ohms, right? Um, so A is going to be minus 18. And I guess really it should be minus 18,000, right? Because we're going to have to multiply this equation by 1,000. Sure, yeah, I'll make it minus 18,000. Uh, <laughs> And then we'll have B and C. So C is going to be like two and a half or so. And yeah, I guess I should provide the ranges here too. So this needs to go from minus 22,000 to minus 18,000. Those are the bounds. B can go from 300,000 to 350,000. And C can go from 2 to 2.5. There we go. All right, so that gives us some control over our LDR uh, behavior, which is kind of nice. I'll put these kind of in the middle of the ranges for now, just to keep things, keep things interesting. Uh, so this will be 2.25. I'll put the zeros there because I like it that way. All right. And so this is going to be an instance of LDR map that lives in the struct. Cool. So basically, what we're going to want to do here is also have an info for mod data. Yeah, we're going to want to have some mod data in there. And so what we're going to want to do here is have the LDR data vector have enough uh, samples per block. So we're saying, please write it as 300K or 300E3. Well, yeah, E3 might make sense. The, the problem here, and I don't want to get confused about this, is that this is not this is not exactly a resistance value. This is this is a math value, right? Which I guess I guess it would be in units of ohms, but I don't know. I want to be careful here and make sure that I'm not thinking of it as a resistance value when it's not. But yeah, maybe maybe doing the ease would be better. Sure. E3, yeah. All right. Um, okay, so we're resizing our LFO data. Um, we'll have our float star mod data. Um, that's correct. Okay. So when we're in here, the first thing that we're going to want to do is fill, L fill the LDR, LDR LFO data. So let's make a little method to do that for us. Uh, so we'll have float star mod data, float star L, uh, LDR data, and uh, the last one here is going to be no samples, right? Um, I'll just call this fill LDR data. Um, and then let me make some things const here so that I know I can't change them. Uh, that should be const. Cool. So the first thing we're going to want the first thing we're going to want to do in here is fill the LDR data. So we'll have our mod data. We'll have our LDR LFO data. Data. We'll have our num samples. And so what we're going to do is we're going to want to loop through these. So for 
no, symbols plus plus n and LDR data equals LDR data and it equals B times E to the CX plus A. So this is going to be LDR. Oh, I need the map too, don't I? Let's, uh, Univibe stage LDR map. Yeah, so we'll have map dot B times the exponent of map dot C times mod data N plus map dot A. Right. Um, cool. And now I can just add in the map. Oh, that'll be our map. All right. So that should be our that should be our our work there. Now I wonder if I can make a little test for this. Well, no, I don't know. I don't really feel like doing that right now. That's okay. Um, I, I will have a test for this at some point, but not immediately. Um, now I may want to use an approximation here. So let's see, ESP approx, is that what it's called? Here we go, power prox, exp. Eh, probably okay. There we go. So we're not doing full precision exp. We're going to do uh, uh, approximation just to make things faster. I don't know how much it'll help, but it'll probably make a difference. Um, Let's see. All right. So we fill the LDR data. So now we know for every sample in our buffer what the LDR value should be. Um, so now we just need to go through and uh, actually use the LDR data. We also need to go ahead and make our stages. So let's see, include univibe stage. And so let's see, univibe stage. Stages. Uh, for now, I'll just do four, just to keep it the same as the original pedal, and then later we can decide if we want to maybe go to more, or maybe go to fewer. I don't know. Do something fun with it. Um, and so, what we're gonna want to do here? Well, maybe I'll leave it alone for now. But what we're gonna want to do? Please go through our stages and go like stages zero dot LDR map dot a equals like some other number in this range. So we could do like minus 21 or something instead of 20, right? And just have some fun uh, setting these to different values. Maybe I'll just do that now. So I'll, I'll let, I'll let, uh, zero have the default values, but then I'll, I'll change the values for one, two, and three, right? So we'll have this be the maximum small number or the, the smallest absolute value number in the range, which is 300. I got my, oh no, I don't want that to be negative. Whoops, okay. Good thing I count myself, uh, all right. Uh, and we'll do 2.1, I don't know. So I'm just sending these to like random numbers right now. Um, but I, I don't want them to be like truly random. I want to have them be the same every time, but you know, just numbers that aren't strictly related to anything aside from, you know, I guess whatever's going through my head when I write it down here. Uh, okay, so this will be, let's do like 19, I guess, I don't know. Uh, make this like 315, I guess. Uh, and that'll be 2.0. And then for A, or sorry, for stage three, we'll have minus, I don't know, minus 22. We'll have 350 and 
uh, oh, I don't know. I guess I'm doing all the big numbers for this one. Let's swap them around a little bit. All right, sure, whatever. Um, so not really random, but hey, you know, whatever. And so now here, when we're processing our audio, uh, here we go. We're gonna want to do something like this. Um, actually, you know what? We're probably gonna want to do this a little differently because we're, we might have two channels here. So maybe this should be a float star star. I don't know. Uh, hmm. In that case, I might as well just do audio buffer. Yeah, let's do that. Um, although, in this case, we have separate audio input and audio output buffers. So maybe I don't want to do that. Yeah, yeah, let's do, let's do it a little different here. So we've got buffer out. We've also got our const buffer in because we might have to be processing this out of place. Actually, I think we can, I think we can say that we're always going to be processing this out of place just to make sure that we don't have to worry about pointer aliasing or anything like that. Um, all right, so we've got buffer in and then buffer out. That should be correct. Yeah. Um, mm, oh, right, num sample is no longer a thing. So, um, so num samples equals buffer in. Get num samples. There we go. Uh, so, what we're going to want to do here is have our num channels. Well, actually, let me remind myself how I did this before. Um, yeah, that's basically how we want to do it. Um, except we don't want to make a copy. We just want to do something else with it. Um, all right. So we've got our input buffer. We've got our output buffer ready to go. So now we can say for auto stage in stages, stage process, audio in buffer, audio out buffer, and then mod out buffer, get read pointer, channel zero. And so I guess we want this to be, we want to make sure that the mod data is constant. Yes. Okay, cool. We also want to make sure that we're preparing our stages. So let's go back and make sure that we did that. Um, let's see, let's put that here, I guess. Um, stage dot prepare. Um, stage dot prepare sample rate. Samples per block, All right? Cool. So now let's actually get to some of the fun stuff here and get the phasing circuit going. So in the paper, they work out this, uh, basically this version of the phasing circuit here where we've got uh, these two alpha and beta gains. I guess they're inverting gains. I don't know how much that matters. Um, how do they describe them here? Here they have them as positive numbers, always kind of close to one. That's interesting. Oh, I remember why that is. Um, anyway. Um, and then we've got these two capacitors. We've got the DC capacitor and the, the P capacitor. 
And so we're going to work out the transfer function, or really we're going to let them work out the transfer function. Uh, they go through these simplifications here, which are fairly straightforward. Um, and then they basically give the transfer functions for each leg in terms of this k variable. k is computed by looking at the capacitors. Um, all right. And then we get the frequency response and the phase response. And I think they actually plopped it down here. There we go. So it's kind of like a high shelf thing, uh, but it's, I guess it's going to be like a sweeping high shelf thing. That'll be interesting. Um, yeah, and we, we've got pretty significant variation between the capacitors in the, in the four stages, which is kind of interesting. I didn't really expect that. I thought they would be fairly close, but I suppose not. Um, all right, so they go through some other math here. I don't think we actually care about that because I was looking at their discrete model, which goes a slightly different way. So they've got this discrete model with the HDC, H minus, and H plus. Where do they work those out? Oh, here we go. Yeah. There we go. All right. So they've got some nonlinearities too, which are basically, in their case, they fit it to the uh, response of the transistors, basically. In our case, we may want to do something a little more creative there. Um, also, we don't have the transistors in front of us, so nothing we can do about that anyway. Um, all right. So H, C, N, H, E, N. Those basically come from uh, the the circuit above. Um, and then we've got these nonlinearities and, and biasing factors. And then they do uh, basically a normalized gain on each side of the uh, each side of the nonlinearity. All, all the stuff after the nonlinearity here is all linear, so it doesn't really matter. Um, Oh, oh, right. So they do a DC blocker. I don't think that really matters because, like, we can just figure out what is the zero point of the nonlinearity and subtract that out. I think that would be a little bit simpler than the DC blocker, but I don't know. Maybe it, maybe it's different. Um, all right. So let's see here. Um, All right, omega naught. Okay, so we've got our constants, we've got our omega naught. Um, and then we've got alpha and beta. Hmm. So each stage is indeed modeled one way, input to output, yeah. At least that's what it seems like. Uh, there may be some more details later in the paper that I haven't gotten to yet. Um, I'm curious. So they don't seem to give a value for the DC blocking capacitors. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know exactly. I don't know exactly what those values are. Um, okay, Ethan says, I have a univibe in real life. It is tuned up by GST Greg to vintage numbers. The series pass input stage does seem to have some sweet, a sweet second order harmonic. Yeah, so we'll get that uh, with some of the nonlinear behavior here. We should be able to get some of those neat harmonics. Um, I kind of want to figure out a way to give the user some controls over that, but I haven't worked that out entirely. Uh, I wonder if the full model is too expensive for real time. Uh, 
you mean, I guess you mean like a full white box model. I don't think so. I, I'd imagine it could work in real time. It, it is a lot of transistors, but I bet I bet they could get it working. Um, the thing that I think makes sense for the gray box model is the way they treat the light dependent resistors. I think that's uh, I think that's a good thing to do as a gray box thing. Yeah, having like a white box model of that could be done, but it, it would get pretty it, it would get kind of dicey. Uh, there, there's so much stuff that happens in the lamp to LDR interaction that it, I feel like it would just get it would get messy pretty quick. Okay, Ethan knows the DC blockers are one microfarad. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> I would have had to look it up, but now I just know it. Awesome. Uh, cool. So we're going to have a different CP value for each stage. I'll just use the ones they provide there. I don't know exactly what to do with these alpha and beta values because we're going to if, if we just use what they're doing down here, we're going to get something a little different anyway. I don't know. Well, you know what? Sure. Let's, let's do it. Let's do it his way. Um, so for this to work, we're going to need a few things set up here. So we've got our LDR stuff. Next, we're going to need a... C D C, which is going to be one E minus six. Thanks, Ethan. We're also going to need a C P, which is going to be. <laughs> I'll just say it's like ten nano or something, and then we'll set that. We'll set a different value for each stage anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Um, and then we're going to need. So the R stuff is kind of already worked out. Um, well, not exactly, because we still have the R LDR and R6 thing. So R prime is the LDR plus R6. We were just looking at the LDR uh, when we did our mapping. So uh, we're going to have to add R6. <laughs> Ethan, if you know what R6 is. That'd be cool. I mean, I can look it up, but if you happen to know it off the top of your head, that'd be neat too. Um, so R6, we'll work that out ourselves. We'll, we'll use that later. So I'll just say it's 1K for now. Uh, so let's see. Um, Yeah, let's do let's do this. So we're gonna need a IR filter for uh did I get the argument order wrong? Yeah, I probably did. Uh so this will be H plus, and then we're gonna need one for H minus, right? Um, oh, we're going to want the alpha and beta values too, I guess. Sure, why not? Um, those are both somewhere around one. Um, float alpha equals uh, one and beta also. <laughs> okay, cool. Ethan knows it. It's 4K7. Thank you. 4.7. There we go. Um, all right, cool. So I think we've got everything we need. We'll, we'll get there. Um, So, okay, so we've got K and omega naught per stage. Uh, does he do any frequency warping? I feel like he doesn't. Maybe that's okay. Uh, where does he compute that? Oh, okay, there we go. All right, easy enough. Um, so I guess we don't need the 
sample rate. We'll, we'll figure that out in a second. Um, all right. So, um, Texas AD warping. Oh, okay. I guess I just hadn't, hadn't found that spot yet. Um, so let's see. H plus, we want to prepare it for two channels. Same with H minus. Um, so let's do this for auto CH data in iterate over the buffer. Um, oh, actually, I don't know how well this is going to work. Yeah, whatever. Let's just do it this way. Or iterate over our channels. So four and CH equals zero. CH is less than um, channels CH. Um, or zero is less than um, samples plus plus n. Cool. Um, so we'll have our X data from the audio buffer in. And we've got our Y data coming from buffer out. And it's going into buffer out. And so here we can do our per sample processing. So first we need our, uh, First, we need our H plus and H minus worked out. So um, well, actually, first we need our Ks, right? So uh, const auto. Is that K or is that kappa? Technically, it's kappa. So kappa E equals. C V C over C V C and then uh K C is C P over that. Did I get that right. KC is CP, KE is that. All right, cool. And then, oops, let me just, no. What do they call it? W naught, omega naught. Omega zero equals one over R prime. Okay, so for this, we need. Uh, one over, so the resistance value R6 plus the LDR data at this sample, All right? And that's gonna be times uh, that and divided by C, B, C times C, P. So this is not the most efficient way to do things. There's probably a bunch of things that can be pre-computed and whatnot, but for now, we're just going to do it this way, and then we'll optimize it later. Um, so let's see. Let's see here. All right, so we're also going to want to, I guess, do this auto. Is it just tan? Yeah, tan omega zero equals tan 
Yeah, and again, we may want to do a uh, we may want to do like a uh, approximation there, but we can get to that later. Um, so h minus dot set cofs. So h minus is this top path, right? Um, well, maybe let's just stick with this diagram for now. Uh, B C. All right, so that's hmm. Maybe I shouldn't do H minus and H plus. Maybe I should do H C and H E. I think that would be. I think that would be better. Less uh, less confusing if I go back to the, the paper for reference. Um, H C and H E. So let's see, for HC, I want to do this. Uh, let me put these side by side here. All right. So for HC, I want this to be kappa C times tan omega zero plus one. And then same thing, but minus one. So I guess he did like a bilinear transform here. Uh, I don't know if he goes through it explicitly in the paper, but that's fine if he doesn't. Um, I trust the champ did the right thing. Uh, <laughs> let's see, okay. Oh, I guess he doesn't normalize, does he? Right, because that should be one there. Yeah, okay. Um, then let's do this. Let's do uh, const auto bc uh, equals this. Right. Uh, I have to do it that way. Maybe it's like that, right? Okay. And then same thing with AC, but for AC, we can do it uh, like this. And then when we actually go to set things here, we can divide out a a zero, right? So BC zero over AC over AC zero. AC1 over AC0, and then same thing here, except that we know is just going to go up to one, and then that's AC1 like that. All right. So again, maybe not the most efficient way to do it, but that's fine. We'll optimize it later. Yeah, and remember, we're doing this every sample, so it's probably going to be pretty inefficient. But yeah, like I said, for right now, we don't care about that. We just want to get it right, and then we'll optimize it sometime later on. Um, all right, so this is just kappa E, I guess, for both of them. Kappa E and kappa E, all right, simple enough. Um, and then same denominator, I guess, yeah. Cool, so E. Cool. And now uh, I want to do basically this addition here where I do alpha times the output of HE minus beta, times the output of uh, H, uh, HC. So what I want to do here is uh, let's do Y data 
10 equals alpha times uh, alpha times H E, right? Yeah, H E uh, process sample. Uh, so I'm going to process X beta sub N. And it's going to be on channel CH, right? Did I get that right? Read only variable. Oh, this should be get the right pointer. That'll do it. And now minus beta doing the same thing. So yeah, again, not optimized, that's okay. <laughs> um, and so now let's see if we can get the same, essentially the same response as what they got in the plots that they show in the paper here. So this is the transfer function of the first stage. Okay, and they're doing it in, okay, in decibels, right? So we're getting a boost of about a dB and a cut of, I don't know, like a tenth of a dB or something. Um, all right. So yeah, again, this is a purely linear model. We'll get to the nonlinearities in a minute. Um, and for now, how about we just say that we have one stage and I'll comment out my little finicky things there that mess with the other stages. And yeah, let's see what that gives us. I think we should get reasonably close, but if not, then we'll figure out where we went wrong and, and fix it. Gonna link. Linking always takes a while these days. Probably because BYOD's gotten so big. Anyway, um, all right, let's see what we got here. So, still on mute, that's fine. We've got all our parameters now. That's good to see. Um, oh, I need to uh, fix some things with the mouse interactions. I must have messed that up a little bit ago when I was uh, messing with some things. Anyway, um, for a later time. Okay, looks like we're going unstable here. That's uh, not a good sign. Is that the case? Let's see. Yeah, it must have had some kind of instability in there. All right. Let's see where we went wrong. Okay, they are pre-warping. Um, let's see here. So let's start there. Kappa C. Kappa C is CP over CP plus CDC, right? Kappa E is the opposite, CDC over the same denominator. Um, omega naught is one over R prime. One over R prime. Okay, so we might have maybe messed up something with our LDR. That's possible. Um, you know what? For now, let's just fill the LDR with zeros. See if that fixes it, and that'll let us know that that's where we messed up. Um, and then times CDC plus CP over CDC times CP. That looks right. Now, for our uh, for our uh, 
filter equations here. We've got Kc and omega zero plus one. Kc tan omega zero minus one, tan omega zero plus one, tan omega zero minus one. Then we're dividing everything through. All right, and then we got kappa E, kappa E. And then same kind of thing going on there. All right. Yeah, so let's try it with uh, without the LFO. Basically, we've taken out the LDR entirely. And so we should have something uh, something that is stable, hopefully. And then we can figure out what's going on with the LDR. All right, there we go. So it's stable. It's just not very interesting, <laughs> which is fine. Yeah, again, we can uh, we can get that working shortly. Um, just one more thing to check first, though. So going back to their plot, this was for r prime equals 400k, right? So right now the r6 is 4.7k. So we'll just say that this is 400, 400 K and see what happens. Yeah, yeah, warnings are unhappy, whatever. Um, See, so that's what we've got. That's a little bit odd. I would have expected, I would have expected something different, right? Um, hmm. Yeah, I would have expected something a little more like that. Said we got this kind of large-ish drop there. So what? Uh, what are we doing wrong here? Maybe. Um, 400k, right? So that's 400k plus this 4k. So yeah, we should be in the ballpark there. Um, and then they're in series, so we're adding them. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, okay, and then we're doing one over that. Yeah, okay, all this seems like it should work. AC omega zero N as omega zero. Um, hmm. One over R prime. Where do they define R prime? Just to double check myself. Um, R prime equals LDR plus R6. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Um,
feel like maybe I messed up something here as far as AG and HC. No, maybe not. All right. Yeah, because that's HC, and that's in the minus beta part of the part of the system. Um, okay, maybe it's not a big deal. Maybe uh, maybe I'm not looking at the right part of the frequency spectrum. Got ten over two. Sorry, ten squared radians per second. So that's uh, oh man, radians to hertz. Uh, we go times two pi. Uh, I always I always mess this up. Angular frequency. Uh, okay, two pi f. Um, okay, omega equals two pi f. So really, that's like. Uh, Hundred radians per second is equal to uh, what is it like? Uh, divide by hundred divided by six is like what thirty or something? I don't know. Huh. Something still seems off to me, and I, I can't put my finger on it. Yeah, because why would increasing R prime to bring down the, the gain of the whole thing, right? That seems off. Yeah, and why, why isn't the sample rate used at all? That can't be right. Um, okay, my guess is that some are in here. They did bring in the sample rate without telling anyone. <laughs> right, because usually, usually when you do a frequency like this in uh, discrete time, you do the angular frequency divided by the sample rate or something like that. Like, let me find one of my filter designs. Yeah, like we have this compute k value thing. We do, okay, yeah. Yeah, you know what? Maybe I'll just use my own bilinear transform instead of uh, using their using their version, right? So we're doing angular frequency WC is matched at the sample rate FS. So yeah, let's let's do it this way. Um, float FS equals I don't know, something. If you look at R prime as a mixing resistor, maybe 447K is too high. All that is passing through is the in-phase signal. Yeah, I was kind of thinking the same, but I was just trying to use what they used in the paper to see if I could get a similar plot. Um, but yeah, I don't know. That, that's a good question. Um, all right, so um, anyway, let, let's just try this first and then uh, mess with some different resistor values. So let's see, FS equals float sample rate. Spelled that wrong here. Right. That's odd that the plot is in radians per second. Don't you divide by two pi? So 100 radians per second would be 16 hertz. Yeah, that sounds about right. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Well, lots of scientific papers prefer radians per second. I guess there's something to that. And it does seem kind of neat that the, you know, the crossover happens right around 10 squared. Um, but yeah, I mean, I am expecting a pretty low. Uh, 
pretty low cutoff frequency because it, it is kind of a vibrato, right? So uh, I'd imagine that the whole the whole frequency spectrum would be kind of undulating up and down would be sort of the idea. Um, but yeah, I think I think I've got this worked out now. I'm just going to replace uh, this stuff with my own bilinear transform and use the S domain versions of the filters. So let's do this. Let's float BC in the S domain equals. So let's go back to up here, right? So now we're using HC from up here. So we've got KC omega naught plus J omega, right? Um, I usually do it as J omega over omega naught. So I'm going to do that here. I'm just going to divide through by omega naught. Uh, and let me see. So we have one plus KC, right? We'll have one and then have a C. Um, I should have. I should have this written down in my uh, in formal maps, bilinear. No, formal maps, transform. Uh, what, uh, what is it, second order, bilinear. Oh no, I guess it's first order filter, right? Bilinear, uh, there we go. Um, and A, right? A will be just one and one, right? So let's go to the definition here and I can remind myself how I how I did this. Um, oh, I guess I guess I didn't document it as well as I thought I did. Um, but that's okay because I can just I can just read it here. Um, so we do need to have the omega in there in some spots, right? Um, yeah, we're we're gonna need that anyway. Um, then let's just do it the way that he wrote it here. So we'll have kappa times omega in this one. So kappa times omega zero. And then we'll have uh, omega zero as its own term here, omega zero. And then we'll have uh, float. This will be B, C, Z, so this is the Z domain version. And then the corresponding A coefficients. Oh, we don't want those to be float. Or sorry, we don't want those to be const. Um, all right, so when we do our bilinear transform, we're going to want the, OK, we're going to want the, the Z domain ones first, right? So we'll be B, C, Z, A. CZ and then BCS, ACS. That should do it, right? What's wrong? Oh, we need the K to them, don't we? Um, so let's see. Const auto K equals chat DSP informal maps. Calculate, compute K value angular. So this is the angular frequency omega zero and sample rate fs. And that should give us our k value that we want for the frequency warping. Um, and now finally, we can do hc set coax uh, bcz acz. And I think that should get us in a better place. Um, and now let's try the same thing with uh, the uh, the E formula. So E E E E. 
Cool. So everywhere we're doing E's now. And then for the E term, we've got zero as this, uh, this guy. And then everything else should be the same. Yeah, not a whole lot of differences. Cool. Let's give that a try and see if we get somewhere closer. What did we do wrong? We're not using the kappas anymore, are we? Oh, no, I did this wrong. This should be kappa E. Let's rebuild. All right, yeah, this is fun. We, we always run into trouble with uh, things like this, but then, you know, take it one step at a time and hopefully it gets solved. So that's the, that's the idea. Um, I don't love doing a bilinear transform every sample. That that's probably going to be a little slow, but we can uh, we can work that out later. Like I said, I'm not really interested in optimization right at this at this moment. Um, let's see. So okay, yeah. So that's uh, kind of what I expected, right? Like where uh, you know you're really there's like a really tiny. Uh, game change happening there, which is basically what we had uh, in the, the plot we were looking at here as well. Like the, the whole gain difference is like about a dB. Seems like we're not even getting to a dB. So maybe there's something a little bit off there. Maybe we should be getting a little more of a, uh, a little more of a boost there, but we are getting something and it looks like we've got our our cutoff frequency about right, you know, somewhere around that 16 hertz, like uh, like Rudy was saying. So, yeah, let's see. Let's see now what's going on. Um, if maybe we change this to, I don't know, like 100K to see what that changes. You're only doing one stage, right? I am only doing one stage. My understanding was that this plot was also just one stage, right? Transfer function of the first stage. Okay, yeah. So you should be able to get something similar. I guess I'm using slightly different alpha and beta constants, so that might make a little difference too. Um, the high shelf, the high shelf effect is emphasized as the stages stack up. Yeah, that's what I would expect to happen. Um, Let's see, so, okay, that's with our, that's with the LDR at 100 instead of at 400K. Not a ton of difference. Um, anyway, let's, uh, let's fiddle with alpha and beta then. So let's see, stages zero dot alpha equals, um, what was alpha? One point triple zero nine. Is that really going to make a difference? I don't know. With filters, things always make a difference, I guess. Beta is one point one one. That'll make a difference. Uh, and then CP was the other one that had a lot of variability, right? Um, so CP in this one is point oh one five U, right? So zero point zero one five. Uh, I get that right. Yeah. All right. Let's see what that gives us. All right. So now maybe we'll get something a little closer. Yeah, there we go. That's about a dB, about a dB of change. Yeah, awesome, cool. That's uh, that looks very very close. Um, very very close to what we we're seeing there. <laughs> the Univab one stage at a time. Yep, exactly. And the neat thing is that uh, once uh, once we've got it working. Basically, we can just change the number of stages to four. So right now, we're just doing one stage. I can just make that number four, and boom, we've got four stages. Um, that's the great thing about code. 
uh, <laughs> way easier than doing that with a with a real circuit. Um, but you know, anyway, um, we'll, we'll also tweak these. Uh, you know, we, we've got all these little parameters we can tweak to make each stage a little bit different. So that'll be fun too. Um, don't know that we're going to get to that today, though. We're already eating up a lot of time here. Um, anyway, so now let's try to bring back this guy. And well, let's just see what happens first. And then maybe I'll debug it if, uh, if it blows up again. I'm expecting it'll blow up again. And we'll find out why. So yeah, doing two bilinear transforms in here. I feel like there's some ways to some ways to share some share some work. I don't know. Figure something out. Um, righty, let's see here. So yeah, we've got uh, an instability there. It looks like. Um, let's try attaching. Let's see what let's see what we find. Um, might take a minute here. Right, so this is gonna throw uh, assertions because we've got not a numbers in the buffer, which makes sense. Um, all right, so let's see what's in our LDR data. So we've got something E9. 9e9, that seems a bit too big. And then e10, that's definitely too big, right? Because we are expecting, um, we're expecting numbers that go up to like one meg, two meg, four meg, something like that. And we're getting numbers that are like a thousand times bigger. So did I mess up a scaling thing somewhere, right? Because I, I made, uh, I made these be uh, a thousand times what they were in the Desmos example that we were looking at. Um, where is it here, right? Because in our plot, right, we've got, that's 300. Really, it should be 300K. So we multiplied by a thousand, right? Um, other possibility is, the input signal is wrong uh, and we're getting values that are, are greater than one uh, or something like that. But we can we can test that here. So our mod data, ah, okay, there we go. Our mod data is out of range. Why is that happening? That should not be happening. Um, LFO set frequency. Oh, you know what it could be? It could be a uh, magic circle oscillator getting uh, wonky at, at uh, very low frequencies. That's annoying. Um, let's see how I did uh, let's see how I did things in some of the other modules here. So well, I don't know, tremolo. What did I do in the tremolo? Well, tremolo is weird. That one's got other stuff going on. Um, what did I do in the panner, panner module? Um, rate. Okay, rate starts at rate starts at half a hertz. Generate modulation signal modulator. What is the modulator here? It's a sine wave of float. All right. I mean, Apple's new headset to visualize the frequencies in 3D. Is that something they announced today? I heard they were doing the, uh, uh, whatchamacallit, uh, I heard they were doing the uh, developer conference thing today. I didn't follow it at all. Um, are, are they visualizing frequencies? That's kind of cool. Uh, let's see. Let's see what kind of frequencies we're working with here. So my concern is that I know that the sine wave algorithm that I'm using can sometimes get a little wonky at low uh, 
at low sample rates. So I'm concerned that maybe that's what I'm running into here. But let's find out. So uh, speed param smooth. Um, what kind of values are we working with here? Five hertz. Okay, five hertz should be fine. Um, LFO. Okay, that should be fine. I don't know. I got a feeling something weird is happening here, right? Because, uh, well, let's just see. Yeah, yeah. All right. Come on. There we go. You're making an audio plugin type of application for Android. No, this is this is meant to run on desktop. Uh, I've fooled around with Android audio stuff a little bit. Never found it particularly easy to work with, I guess. Um, oh, you know what? I know what the problem is. I think I know what the problem is here. The uh, audio buffers by default, or the, the juice uh, audio buffers by default, won't be cleared at each process block. And uh, the LFO will add to the existing signal unless you clear it. So I think that's what I'm doing wrong here. Um, anyway, sorry sorry to stop in the middle of your question, of answering your, your question there. Um, but yeah, um, this is meant to be a desktop, uh, a desktop plugin and application. Um, I have fooled around a little bit with uh, trying to get some audio stuff working on Android before. There's a lot of latency. It was kind of a tricky process. Uh, I don't know. I don't love mobile development in general. And Android Studio didn't fully agree with me for whatever reason. Um, there is some work going on. There's a fellow on GitHub who's been doing some cool stuff with trying to build audio plugins for Android. And it seems like he's been moderately successful at getting a lot of cool things to work. So that's definitely a uh, Definitely a cool thing. I also have some projects in, Ru in Rust. Yeah, I've been meaning to do a stream where I mess around with NIH plug for a while. Um, NIH plug is super cool. I don't know if folks here are familiar with NIH plug, but yeah, it's a really, really neat uh, plugin framework. Supports VST3, CLAP, lots of cool stuff, all in Rust, a few different UI libraries. Um, yeah, I spent some time with Jai and someone someone mentioned like, oh, if you're messing with Jai, you should mess with Rust. And I have, I just haven't done it on the stream. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I'll, I, I need to do that. That'll be fun. Um, I don't know, I've just been kind of engrossed with BYOD lately. So that's been eating up a lot of my, eating up a lot of my energy. Um, but yeah, we, we will make some time to do some NIH plug stuff. That'll be fun. And I'm not very good at Rust, so hopefully, People in the comments can can help me. Maybe I'll, I'll try to ask Robert, the fellow who develops an IH plug, to help me because obviously he's like an expert at Rust and can tell me all the things I'm doing wrong. So it looks like our LFO is working, but it's modulating this low frequency part of the signal here that I feel like won't really be audible. <laughs> that's all below like 20 hertz. I feel like that's not going to make any sound. Interesting. Let's see if uh, if I up the speed, it does some things. Yeah. Okay. Nothing that interesting though. And intensity, the intensity knob isn't actually mapped to anything right now, so we're not going to get any not not going to get any kind of interesting behavior. So, what am I doing wrong here? Why am I getting, uh, what's the input stimulus? Oh, that's a good question, actually. Yeah, so the uh, the uh, tool that I'm using here, the EQ curve analyzer, it inputs these little spikes. Um, you can kind of see, you can kind of see them on the meter there. Um, yeah, and you, usually those do a decent job of kind of filling out the whole spectrum. I, I don't think, a different input stimulus would get us much of a different result here, but we can try actually. 
Um, let's do a test tone, test tone, test tone. Oh, come on, I scroll past it. Uh, test tone, there we go. And get some white noise going. And now we can take a look at spectrum analyzer here with no tilt. Yeah, I'm not really seeing much. Uh, not really seeing much change there. Interesting. Maybe it's time to bump up uh, how many stages we're we're using. I'm just wondering what we were observing, like the frequency response of what input. Yeah, so just a, a pulse train basically. Uh, which we can do that in Bitwig too, actually. That'll be interesting to see. Um, oh, that's kind of interesting. Huh. Oh, there we go. Yeah, that's our that's our pulse train. Um, okay. And yeah, let's make it louder there. All right. Yeah, so you can kind of see the bottom end wiggling around there, but that, that's not what I expected. I expected it to be more of the full range, uh, full range of the signal going up and down. Um, so what did I do wrong? What did I, what did I do wrong here? Um, Omega naught equals one over R prime, all that stuff. Yeah, okay. In course mode, the sweeping high shelf causes the low end of the signal to match what the output would be in vibrato mode and is responsible. Okay. Maybe our mapping, uh, maybe our resistor mapping is still a little bit off. So I, I fixed the uh, issue with the LFO blowing up, but it's possible that our LDR data is still doing some funky things. So yeah, let's uh, let's give that a try. See what we get. Um, here, let's go back to uh, the EQ curve analyzer here. All right. All right, so LDR, sorry, LFO, LDR, LFO data. Okay. All right, so we've got, that's like 1.2K, I guess, something like that. Um, oh, you know what I'm doing wrong? I'm doing plus instead of times here. That would do it. Um, it may be a good time to bring in the intensity parameter as well, now that I'm looking at this. So let's go ahead and do that. So I'm thinking we'll do another smooth buffer value, and this will be the intensity. The intensity param smooth. We don't need that at the moment. So. Let's go ahead and do the same kind of thing here. So the intensity ran smooth, and this will be the intensity tag. Cool. And CT tag, if I can spell it right. Um, and you know, same kind of thing here. All right, and so when I go to process a stage, I should probably also pass in the intensity data. Oops. 
this would be a TCD data. And then I'll put that into here as well. So we got the intensity data. Um, yeah, and so here we'll do times intensity data. And, then, and of course, there's probably ways that we can uh, make that more optimal. But for now, let's just do it the simple way. And here we'll do uh, stage process intensity times move get smooth buffer. Sweet, and that'll give us the data that we want to work with. Let's see what that gives us. Maybe something a little different here. Okay. That's a little more interesting, at least. Um, <laughs> kind of like it's doing the wave or something. Um, and then let's see if I crank up the intensity. Okay, it gets more intense. I was kind of expecting, again, I was kind of expecting it to be more of a full range thing. But maybe not. Maybe that's not what it sounds like. Uh, let's see. Maybe I can listen to it. Uh, let's see here. Let's see if my speakers will make some noise here. A bass snake, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, what am I doing wrong here? Um, Make it loud. I don't know. Huh. Not being sent to my speakers. Aggregate device. No. Wait. Why is it going to the aggregate device? I think I want it going there. No, aggregate device should be fine. Yeah, that that should be all right. Um. Hmm. Okay. That's. Strange. Uh, let's see here if I actually put some audio on there. Uh, I don't have any guitar available at the moment, but we have these drums, so maybe we can listen to this. Oh, okay. There we go. Don't want it to be too loud. Oh, okay, it's also extra loud because of that. Oops. Okay, so it's definitely doing something, even if it's not uh, especially audible right now. Um, and I'll get some guitar going here in a second so we can hear it more on the intended material. Let's go up to four stages, see what we get. So maybe kind of what I'm feeling like here, oh, uh, we can't hear it over the stream. Yeah, I guess Zoom is gonna block it uh, or with its like noise thing. I'll see if I can switch the, the Zoom setting here in a minute. Um, but kind of what I'm feeling is like maybe four stages is like the minimum. And then we go up to like a max of like 20 or something, something big like that. Let's get some light here as well. Um, all right, so all right, 
uh, I'm just gonna go back to the EQ curve analyzer for a minute and then I'll get some uh, audio going again. So let's see what we got here. <laughs> okay. Not the way we'll mess up the LDRs. Yeah, I wish. Um, all right. So there we go. Okay. Um, so we're definitely getting more, definitely getting more of a of a change now, I think, right? I don't know, kind of interesting. Um, still not as much as I had expected though, right? Yeah, like that, that seems like a really small amount of change. And then, yeah, if we bring the intensity down, then it goes to zero. That's what we expect. Um, yeah, that really doesn't seem like a whole lot of change in the, uh, really doesn't seem like a whole lot of change in the, in the frequency spectrum. Um, yeah, it's interesting too, because I was expecting that with more stages, it would get more extreme. I wonder if, my default choices of the alpha and beta parameters have something to do with it. So instead of one, uh, let's try to pick something kind of like what they had in the in the table here. Um, yeah, okay, so beta should be closer to like 1.1, right? And then alpha can be around one. All right, maybe that'll give us something a little bit better. Oh, kids are playing outside. I don't know if you guys can hear that. <laughs> Not my kids, other other people's kids. Um, all right, let's see. Come on. All right, that looks a bit more interesting. Still only seeing about a dB of, of uh, movement there, which I don't love, but you know, whatever. Um, anyway, let's see what it sounds like here. On some real sound. Maybe you guys can hear that now. Yeah, still not like the most interesting uh, changes in the sound. Let's see. a ton of audible changes I feel like we should be getting I feel like we should be getting more of a difference right um, let's see we've got our LDR mapping yeah we should double check this mapping because it's possible that there's something off with that and that's why we're not getting as much modulation I'd love also to see if they have a, a plot in the paper that shows maybe the full uh, maybe the full frequency response. Doesn't look like they do. That's okay. All right. Hmm. Okay. All right, well, I don't know. Maybe I should call it a day here. I've been working at this for quite a while, so maybe it's uh, 
maybe it's time to uh, kind of let things uh, let things rest for a bit, and then we can pick it up again on another day. Um, let me just read read through a few more bits here. Okay. Yeah, maybe uh maybe I need to have the uh different capacitor values in there. Let's try that. Um where is it? Here we go. All right. So in here we've got uh we've got these uh which we'll do for all of the uh all of the stages. So that's stage 0, stage 1. to mu 0 0.98 1.09 so 22 oh 0.22 whoops 0 0.22 0 0.98 1.09 All right uh this is 470p It's almost seven o'clock here. I should probably uh, probably call it pretty soon. Um, but yeah, thanks for those of you who are still here. Thanks for sticking with me through this uh, process. It's always a always a challenge. Always uh, always have to try uh, some new and interesting things to debug uh, debug your DSP code and get everything working just right. Um, so yeah, it seems like maybe we're getting a little higher up, uh, higher up the chain there. I don't know. It, it doesn't seem right because uh, I think Rudy pointed out earlier, like when you go to more stages, you should get this. This one dB should become something more like four dB, right? So yeah, that's the thing. So George is saying more stages equals longer snake, and I guess that kind of makes sense. But I was also expecting more stages equals larger snake, uh, <laughs> and that's what I'm not seeing, you know. Um, oh, you know what it is? We have the audio input buffer and the audio output buffer, and every time we're oh, we're restarting with the audio input buffer. So what we need to do is uh, do it like this. So. Um, for the very first stage, stages zero should be like that, right? Stages zero process, and then uh, for the rest of the stages, so we want to go size int uh, stage index 
equals zero stage index is less than size of stages stage index right uh we'll make that an end i guess stages stage index and now instead of audio in buffer we're going to do audio out buffer i think that should be fine i don't think we'll get any pointer aliasing but if that happens we'll find out and we'll figure it out from there cool so i was doing the the staging incorrectly hopefully now that that's fixed we'll get something a little bit more uh, a little bit more interesting sounding <coughs> Oh yeah, okay, that looks interesting, all right. <laughs> That's fascinating. All right, let's try, uh, let's try with our uh, white noise input. kind of interesting. I'm not convinced that's exactly right. Something still seems a little bit off about it to me. Um, but let's try, you know. not quite right but you know like you said interesting in a different way um we'll have to debug it a little more figure out exactly what's going on um but yeah i'm not sure that's a task for me today i think that's probably a task for me on a different day uh let's bring this down a bit see exactly what's happening so yeah we're getting these funky spikes where are the spikes coming from Huh. Interesting. Interesting. Let's try something here. Let's examine the uh, examine the LFO signal. It's not gonna behave properly in. Uh, not gonna behave properly in. Uh, what do you call it? Uh, the spectrum analyzer here, but. Should be able to hear something by now, right? We're at uh, 15 hertz, 16 hertz. I don't know, maybe my uh, DC blocker or something is uh, making it so I can't hear it out my speakers, which is probably for the best, honestly. Um, oh no, that's not true. I am able to get it uh, in my speakers, just not all that uh, intensely. Um, all right. Something's still a little bit off about this. Let's see. Uh, hold time. Longer hold time. I don't know. Uh, we do something like that. There we go. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, so the LFO signal seems to be about right. Huh, okay, so what are we doing wrong? Well, <laughs> hmm. To, uh, I may have to save this for another day, just given how, uh, how late it's getting, how tired I'm getting. Um, but yeah, thanks for tuning in. If anyone's got any uh, final questions or things they're curious about, I'll hang out for another minute or two and uh, not worry about this stuff. Uh, actually, I'll just, I'll just make a branch for it and figure it out from there.
So let's see what's left to do. Um, to do. He says, thank you for the stream. I always learned a lot. Thank you, guys. I saw you also worked with Audio Weaver. Uh, Audio Weaver. Oh, yeah, I did a little work with Audio Weaver way back in the day. Um, well, actually, not that long ago. So it was like three years ago. Um, yeah, I didn't use it a ton. Um, but, it, yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting, pretty useful for a lot of, uh, like, embedded devices and things like that. Um, I don't know that I really worked with it enough to say, you know, a ton of uh, useful information about it. But yeah, it's, kind of, it's, an, it's an interesting system. All right, yeah, it looks like everyone's, everyone else is tired too. So yeah, let's all go and, uh, and rest for a while. And yeah, I'll see you guys maybe next week or maybe uh, some other time uh, uh, in a week or two from now. All right, later guys.